Thanks. <laughs> really, um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this is um, a, a Wordle. If you don't know what Wordle is, um, Wordle.com uh, allows you to take your text, an entire paper or even a book, copy it and stick it into a little box, and then it produces a um, you know it produces a word list where the where the most frequent words are um, the largest, and it produces them at random um, in different colors and and. Um, so that, that's the wordle of a paper becoming a Nazi. Um, so it's actually fun, and you can um, summarize an entire talk just like that, uh, as if just the, the frequency of the word was the thing that mattered. Um, I, um, I'll say just a few words about what interests me in the world of oral history, and then I'll say a few words about the two projects that are at least cognate to oral history that I've been involved in. And then um, I'll say a couple words about a student of mine and then basically open up for, for discussion. Uh, I see that Mary Marshall Clark has arrived. I'm sorry, I was teaching at J-School. That's okay. I, I think you, you know what I'm going to say anyway. Well, you don't because I don't know what I'm going to say, but uh, within a realm of domains of things said, um, you do. Um, then, um, so I, I'm a, in this world. I'm a historical sociologist, and, and, and have always been interested in in understanding um, historical phenomena and, and making sense of them. And I've and I've especially been interested in trying to develop a framework with, within my discipline, sociology, for for understanding how to make sense of people's actions in the world. And um, typically in my discipline, the, the strategy that we use to develop causal explanations or to develop explanations of historical outcomes or explanations of anything is that we observe some action in the world. Someone joins a riot, someone participates in a movement, someone engages in um, a solidaristic action of some sort. And, and, and we then look back to the social structural position of that person, their class, their ethnicity, whether they own land, the attributes that they have. So we try to capture something about them from the characteristics that they have. And, and, and then we impute motive where we observe characteristics of people and we observe their action and we bridge that gap to the imputation of motive. We say, well, people do that because it's in their interest to do that. So a classical sociological account of the Nazi seizure of power, for example, would focus on the fact that the early Nazis were uh, young, uh, dispossessed on the one hand and petty bourgeois on the other hand. And, and the classical sociological understanding of why people joined the Nazi party, just to pick one outcome, would be that for the petty bourgeoisie, it was in their interest. The Nazis somehow had an ideological program um, against, against socialism, against liberal democracy that appealed to the petty bourgeoisie. They thought they could realize their interests by support of this party. Um, and so we, we, that's how we tend to make explanations, and, and that's, that's a strategy that's unsatisfying to me, or has been unsatisfying to me for a long, long time. And what I was always interested in doing is understanding how to, how to make explanations that worked on another foundation, which was people's sense of self, so their sense of identity. And, and Social network analysis as a, as a way of thinking about the world is a way of thinking about how our identities as actors in the world, as people who inhabit the world, are shaped by the, so are shaped by the social relations in which we're embedded. So necessarily if I'm, if, if I'm embedded in a, in a population of people who, who have, whose sense of self is that their, is that their, um, is their sense of self is, is associated with a, a set of practices and beliefs that 
that they can recognize themselves as a, a member of a group or a, a kinship group or a clan or something, that that sense of identity is provides the springs for action. So my work historically has been on trying to understand how I could measure the sources of, of, of relations around a person and then think about how those relations shape their identity, their self-consciously held identity, and then try to explain action that I could observe subsequently. And, um, and that's the another foundation for historical sociology that's more similar to oral history, I think. It's, it's more similar to trying to understand the phenomenological experiences of people, and it, and it doesn't have to be historical, it could also be ethnographic. It's the ethnographic project is to understand how people come to see the world, experience the world, and then act in the world. So that, that's that been a, an interest of mine. And, um, and, and out of that interest arose another interest which which is a little harder to describe, but I've become, I became interested in the fact that people's understandings of themselves um, involve, a, a, involve a theoretical enterprise that is their theory of how they got to where they are. And that, that theoretical understanding of themselves that's reported in narrative is actually something a sociologist could really study and oral historians could study. So when I think of somebody telling a life or history, what I'm really understanding is that they're doing what you know, what, what we do when we tell a life history is we stand at some point in the present and, and under some theory, inchoate or not, under some theory we search into the infinite past for events and experiences that have made us get to the present, and then we array those events and experiences into a narrative that, that is in plotted in some way that, that sounds believable to us, and, and if we're trying to convince other people, sounds believable to them. But this, the past is a, a vast sea of experiences, so how to select the events in the past to array to get you to the future requires a theoretical orientation. Even if we don't think about it as a theoretical, even if we don't think about people as theorists, we, we recognize that they're doing what theory does, which is to tell you what not to look at. So when you when when you when you have a theory of something, you, you know that I don't have to. I can deny some data because it's not relevant to the problem, and by denying some data, you are able to see what elements you can use to produce a narrative. So oral history to me is this project that people, or the life story component of oral history is a project of trying to understand how people, when they come to tell their life story, get to where they are. It's, for me, the project is not understanding the history per se, but it's understanding the theory. I'm interested in what's the theory that, that got them there. How, how do people tell stories? And that with the idea that, the, that we might actually learn something that could, that could be revelatory of the world in the past, but doesn't need to be, but we could learn something about, about these people that they may themselves not know, which is revealed in the theory that they use to tell their stories. So this work is all about trying to, trying to understand from life stories what what the becoming process is, how people become something, and and take seriously their own accounts of that becoming. So that's what interests me as an oral historian is not, or as a sociologist is not, how to use history, oral history to tell me something about the past, but how to use oral history to understand how people theorize how they become what they are, because that's what they do when they tell us the other. And the model for me um, has been. Um, a couple of important and a couple of important sources. One is Prop, which I think you're familiar with. But Prop is um, in his book on fairy tales studies the structure of a fairy tale and he reveals that a fairy tale has a has a absolutely common morphological structure that it's 
31 or 29, I can't remember how many elements it is, but at any rate, it's some fixed number of elements that are always in the same sequence. And, and that tells us, the reader, that's, a, that's the genre of the fairy tale. We know it's a fairy tale because it has those elements in that morphological structure. In the, um, and then it doesn't matter what fills the fairy tale. So that's the beauty of, the, of Prop's understanding is that in a, in a particular place, morphologically, in the sequence of these elements, it doesn't matter if, if there's a frog, a queen, a toad, a, a lizard, a, a, a caterpillar. It doesn't matter what it is. Something's there that's gonna, that is going to act or do something. And so, so the content of the story becomes abstractable from its form. So that's one major source that, of influence on me and people who are usually influenced by things like that are often called structuralists. That is, they're interested in the structure that then gets populated by contents. And um, they, they say, well, content is, somebody, somebody can be interested in content, but you know, I'm, I'm doing the structure. So that's one source. And another source is um, the now art critic for the nation, Arthur Dan Danto. Um, uh, but before he became an art critic, Danto was an analytic philosopher of history, and Danto sets up a problem in a book called um, Narration and Knowledge, um, or actually the book is called Analytic, Analytical Philosophy of History, and the chapter that I'm interested in is called Narration and Knowledge, and it's chapter 8 of this book that was written in 1968. He sets up an interesting problem that, well, at least for me, was interesting. He imagines a world in which there was an ideal chronicler of events, or an ideal chronicle of events, so that every event that ever happened, just as it happened, as it happened, was recorded. And then and he says, imagine if there was such a chronicle of events, just this long list of events, and would that, what impact would that have on the historian's craft? And, um, and Danto comes to the conclusion, which is right, that it would have no impact whatsoever about this on the historian's craft, because the historian's craft is not about the discovery of things in the past. It's about the it's about writing a particular kind of narrative account that invokes something he calls a narrative sentence, which is a sentence that that refers to something in the past by a standpoint in the future. So, for example, the classic narrative sentence. On Christmas Eve, 1642, the father of modern physics was born. And of course, that sentence couldn't be true until modern physics was born. And that, by the way, that's Newton. So Newton was born on Christmas Eve, 1642. But the sentence on Christmas Eve, 1642, the father of modern phys physics was born, couldn't have been written until modern physics was born. And that's the historian's problematic, is, that, is, is, is writing sentences like that which then tells you that the past is activated by the future that the historian's craft, what it is about history, is standing somewhere in the future producing the elements in the past that we're going to array through narrative sentences to, to, um, to, to tell a story about how we got to where we are. And in contemporary philosophical orientations or historical orientations, the future can, and the and the organization of the choices of what sentences one chooses to write, that is the facts one chooses to dredge up, are things that we call standpoints. You know, I'm a feminist, I'm a socialist. That standpoint then allows me to select just those facts and write them in the story. This is a problem I've been interested in for a long time, which is, which is how, how could we tell stories that um, were not restricted to just a single standpoint? And, and maybe some of you have seen the movie Rashomon. Um, Rashomon is a Japanese movie. There's a rape. Um, this, the movie is told. It's a little bit, you know, it's an older version of Shortcuts, I guess. But anyway, it's a more sophisticated version. The story is told from four, from four simultaneous, from four points of view. Four different people see the story. But it's not the blind man and the elephant. It's not that one's on the tail and one's on the head. So it's not that they see different things. They see, they share the same events, but they array the events in different sequences. And um, and if you read Genesis, by the way, you'll realize Genesis has four storytellers. The stories were arrayed in different sequence. The elements are all overlapping, and the whole thing is different than what could be revealed by one or another of these people. So what's been interesting to me as a oral historian, also as a sociologist, is how to free ourselves from standpoints so that we could see the past from multiple points of view simultaneously.
Uh, those are the introductory comments to what's my project. Um, and after I talk about what my project is, then we'll talk about yours, which is obviously more interesting. By the way, I'm uh, often abstract, and I, I'm a little bit like a dog that, um, that um, well, I don't know if I'm like a dog, but anyway, when you, <laughs> when you watch, dogs do this weird thing right before they lie down or, 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 or poop, I guess. They, they walk around <laughs> in circles. I've never understood why they do that. My um, uh huh. I got so, used to them because I have raised Irish setters, and they do a really big loop. Uh huh. I don't know quite what the motivation is, but anyway, I know that that I also will will do this a little bit in talks. So you know, if any point seems like you're, you're lost, just interrupt me. I think they do it to clear the grass in the field before they lay down. Oh, well, see, you're imputing motive on the basis of interest. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I've heard. Actually. Uh huh. Yeah, well, it's possible, but we, we gave them that motive. Yeah. It makes no sense. Just to, I don't want to get lost here, but they make a <laughs> circle, right? They don't yeah. lie down in a circle. They, in fact, they, 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 they lie down in, inside the circle, so they're not clearing anything. So, <laughs> the hell with that theory. Um, my, my bad. Yeah. So, I believe that. I don't know how to make this thing work. Uh -huh. You might be too far. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> Somebody wants to press the button? Oh, I think you're close enough. Yeah, try it. Try the left hand thing. Could somebody press the button on the key? Ah, you did it. Oh, okay. Sorry. And now you'll never get back. If you Sorry, use the, the, the back and forward keys. Uh, actually. Oh. Press the but it button. doesn't matter. Now, I think some of you have already seen this with Bill, right? Does I mean, that's the other button? thing. I don't want to go over something Bill did, and you may, maybe everything I've done, Bill has already done, so I can just do this super quickly, right? Two seconds. So, um, uh, a few slides ago, um, well, the, the thing that I, I don't know how Bill teaches this work, so that's always a mystery to me, um, why he teaches it and how he teaches it, but the problem that this work addresses is becoming, and, and so I'll do it super quickly since you've seen it, although not all of you have seen it, and um, and and what we've done here in this project is um, for a single narrative, which is this paper, um, uh, but we have, um, I think, 60-some-odd uh, narratives translated, actually, upstairs that somebody could do this with if they felt like it. And there are another 586 that someone could do with it. Um, these are stories that were written in 19, August 1934, right, before, right after the Nazi seizure of power. Um, about how people became a Nazi, how they joined the Nazi party, and it was a, uh, it's a little, it's a funny, it's a, it's a story that was part of a contest that was sponsored by the SS, so, you, you know, you, you need to know all the things that are contaminating the, the, the production of the material, um, and it's, um, and the, about, uh, I think 600 people submitted stories about how they became a Nazi, and the stories are written by people who are the early joiners of the Nazi party, that is, they joined before 1930, and, and they're a one in 400 sample of the early joiners, and they're people who, if you follow their subsequent careers, if they weren't in the brown shirts and just about to get wiped out, which is half of these people, um, they um, rose to positions of quite remarkable power. So these are very early stories of adherence of the Nazi party, written as it, as a contest for the best story. So um, what we did with these stories is we, we transformed them into graphs. And the, the logic of trying to transform them into graphs was to, was to uh, try to capture a structure of the narration of becoming so that we could identify elements in the becoming process that were central to their own cognition. And, um, Again, this is their theory of how they became a Nazi. So it's their, they're quite purposefully thinking the end point of the story is how I became a Nazi. They're telling that story, they're theorizing it, and they're selecting from their past events that, that, that they wanted to array just in that order to, to tell a compelling story. 
And um, this is a little sub sub slot of the graph. It's um, it's a little um, it's a little uh, sequence of events. I believe that our, our, our boy is um, describing a situation um, where his mom buys him a pair of brown pants. Um, uh, she doesn't know the significance of the brown pants. He feel he re he recognizes the significance of brown pants. He wears them proudly to school. As he's going to school, he has a cognition. I feel like half a Nazi. Um, uh, he goes to school, um, he gets in a fight with two Jewish kids, um, he punches them in the nose, he gets expelled from school, um, and he returns home. And so this little element of the narration is built as a graph um, where the narrative itself um, allows us to draw an arc between an event in the past or the future to an event in the past or the future, that is, that the next event couldn't have happened without the prior one. So it's it's the author's own imputation of causal, causal logic in the story, and this is, this is done by hand without any sophistication, and there's no attempt to be scientific, which I always think is, I think is a waste of time. But if you wanted to try to be scientific, you could use programs that are designed to do this for you. Ethno is one. Um, there are a bunch of programs that basically set up a series of counterfactuals, and you could ask, you know, you can ask, you can undertake a counterfactual experiment in order to ascertain whether you would draw an arc from one node to another, and um, and and that's scientifically legitimate. It gives you a language, a program, and so on. Um, but I don't, I didn't do that, and um, it's not that I'm a luddite. I just, I just can't see any value in doing that. Um, but there is value in in um, getting secure. So if it gives you security, you should do it. I doubt it, you know. I should I probably shouldn't say these things, but you know. Anyway, a lot of a lot of programs that are just you know, they're like blankets. You know, if you if they could be useful and if you need them, they're great. And a lot of people like those blankets, so they like you to use them. So that's one of the problems of disciplinary science. So anyway, we produce a graph that, that is built off the micro-elements of a narrative. You can go to the next slide. And then we um, can represent the entire structure of that single story as a network and subject it to network analysis techniques. And the idea there is that by, by subjecting it to network analysis techniques, we can, we can look at the entire object at one moment and ask questions about that object. That is, what's its structure? What's the central node? What holds it together? What are the pieces that, that one would need to remove to break up the story? And what does it look like as a graph in general? And, and, um, and our idea at the time was that the analysis of the structure might reveal something about, uh, something about the theory of becoming that is not in the individual's cognition. So that one of the things that I am interested in is the limits of individuals theorizing. And I believe, like a true structuralist, that, that people might might have a structural theory of something that, that emerges even if they can't articulate it. And that, that structural theory is selecting this content over that content, that, but, but what's really driving it is, is a theoretical framework. And that's what I was interested in covering. Here this graph shows that if you look over time from the left to the right, um, there's, a, there's obviously a different structure here that's going on. There's, there's the becoming story that are deeply intertwined, deeply theorized, deeply connected. You can move from any given point to any other given point. It's a very coherent story. And then at the point that they transition to being a Nazi, which I think in this story is event 139, what happens is just action, and, and action without narrative. So there's no continuity in the structure. It's just one event after another, and the self is lost. So our, our idea in this illustrative paper was to say you could use narrative network methods to understand the, the, the theory of becoming, what's, that, what's, what's driving it, and then to understand something about what, what's become. And the, 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 the traditional theory of becoming, if you ask people to tell them your, if you ask people to tell you their life story, they will tell you a story that's an assemblage of, of events and people. So the self emerges from the accretion of people onto you and the accretion of social relations onto you and an assemblage of experiences. And that's what we tell people. We tell people how we, we emerge in the context of, of a population of other people, parents, friends, lovers, children, and so on. That self that emerges is, is, is relationally rich. 
the Nazi stories and stories of Alcoholics Anonymous and stories of people who were born again um, and a, a number of other a number of other stories of people who uh, who become who, who take on a master identity that is an identity that trumps all other identities are typically stories of illusion of relation. So rather than the self being emerged um, appearing from the accretion of persons, it emerges from the illusion of persons. And the little story about the the boy getting in the fight, he, he uh, feels like half a Nazi, he gets in a fight, and he gets expelled from school. So he loses his school relations. And his narrative is a narrative of loss. Um, and there's a fantastic narrative of a, of a mother who, um, who uh, her story is the progressive um, slot, uh, death of her husband and then four children um, at the hands of the, um, the Social Democrats in street, in street battles. The Social Democrats killed there are lots of street battles. I mean, the, the Nazi seizure of power was, believe it or not, contested. And, and the Social Democrats killed this family. And, and after each death, she feels, you know, closer to being a Nazi. And, and, and her story is a story of just the complete loss of, of family. So anyway, this is to reveal a, a Rentian idea that the Nazi uh, is just an actor, a soulless, selfless actor. And it's just action without action without people, and that the, that the, what what it means to become a Nazi is to just act. You can go to the next slide. I'm going to try to speed up, and then this tries. This is waste. This is a waste of time. We'll go to the next slide. Oh, okay, that's fine. Well, the slide that we missed. I don't think you can go backwards. Oh, you can. Okay. Oh, well, let's go forward. <laughs> Go forward. Okay. So I had done the slides that we're skipping over rapidly are slides that try to count out what's driving the element with, re with respect to what's the characteristic of the event. Is it a cognition? Is it a macro level event that's exogenous to the actor? Or is it a micro level event that's endogenous to their own life experience? And it makes an argument about the particular placement of cognitive events as driving the narrative at particular moments in time. And, and that's the closest that one could, I can get to prop, which is this ordering of cognitive events as, 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 well, as the elements that are, that are producing the narrative. And this, this slide then says, well, we can color, we can color events by, by themes. And um, we can then ask the question, like, how central is that theme to the narrative as a whole. And, um, and then here we can identify some themes like chaos, exposure to Nazis, anti-Semitism, the theme of order, and so on. And, um, and we, can try to, we can try to discover that, that some kinds of themes turn out to be, um, have greater centrality. And by centrality in the network, I'm thinking about the node that if you took it out, the rest of the thing would fall apart. So, and in, in this particular narrative, and actually in the narratives in general, this tension between chaos and order is the most central trope that's used. And so it's, it's the thing that occupies the, the core of the narrative, and it drives it forward. So if you take it out, the becoming process is lost. And the mechanism then is this exposure to Nazis. So, so the stories typically are experience of chaos, the recognition of order, the contact with a Nazi. And these are the elements that hold the whole thing together. And, you know, what's missing is anti-Semitism. And that could either because it's canonical, you know, it's so present that you can't even tell a story about it, um, which must be the case, or, or they don't even theorize it. Uh, it's not even theorizable as, uh, as, as it can't even be deployed. Um, I guess that's the same thing because it's such a canonical experience. So one of the limits of this is that you can't distinguish between the canonical experience that can't be told because it's so routine, because you can't tell a story of something that's just always there, and the eventful demands of narration, the, the narration demands events, you populate it with things that happen. And if something is canonical, that is, it simply can't be told because it's always the same, you may never get it from a life history. Um, the canonical example, I guess, is you know, you're driving down the highway and you see a car behind you and you look in the rearview mirror and it's still there and it's still there. And it never, rarely does that car, you know, fly above you. And, you know, if it did, you know, elevate up and fly and hover above you, you'd tell that story. But 
it's really always just behind you. And so there's no story that you can tell. I mean, it's a boring story to say, well, I was driving and there was a car behind me. And then I looked again and the car was behind me. So the demands of narration then also select on things happening. So that was that. Mm -hmm. Go to the next slide. So this project, I think, was a, was a failure in the sense that um, it, it um, well, the idea was to try to describe a becoming process. And, and, and I think we succeeded in describing a strategy for that. But it failed, um, it failed because we, we didn't solve a class of really difficult problems, which were how to, how to, um, how to compare processes across many different people. How was that? This is a second project. I don't, do you do this in Bill's class? Thank goodness. This is a much more interesting project. So this is a little Chinese village um, called Li Lung, and um, and here are all the people in Li Lung. And um, and an oral historian went into Li Lung and he took life histories of um, the villagers. And um, the little dark people are the people. The dark little circles here are the people that he took life histories from. And the Chinese village is organized into different clans and families. And this slide is supposed to convince you that this is a representative sample of the population of Li Lu with, with respect to who was living there, clans, and so on. And so um, uh, this is the story of Li Lu. You can go to the next slide. And he took life books, and he took life, life histories. And I did the same thing with the life histories as I did with Becoming a Nazi, that as I I transform these life histories into graphs, and this slide is supposed to indicate that that um, people um, are better or worse theorists, and uh, that uh, that um, that some people have very thin lines, very thin, thinly told stories, and in my logic, they're very powerful theorists. So, ordinary people who have a thin narrative, you know, that just goes boom, 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 boom without all these extremes, they're very powerful theorists. They're telling the story of their life, and they got it all lined up. So one of the hallmarks if we look at Alcoholics Anonymous is as you learn how to become an alcoholic, as you learn how to tell the alcoholic story, to get to the point where all you are is an alcoholic, the story becomes thinner and thinner and thinner until it reduces its form to I was always an alcoholic. You know, and everything that happens in the alcoholic life is the consequence of that single fact. So the narration, the, the demand of the powerful theory of, ident of becoming an alcoholic, which is to recognize you're an alcoholic in all your relations and everything, and it always were, is the production of a very powerful theory. So this is to indicate that they're thin and thick theorists, and, and that one of the beautiful things about people in general is that they're not as powerful theorists as historians or sociologists or alcoholics. And that when they tell life stories, you know, they kind of jiggle around. And lots of things are seemingly unconnected to other things. So in this life story here, you know, there's just a bunch of events that just are told. They don't have any relationship to anything else. But this is a more powerful theorist. There's a bunch of little things in the past that don't make any connection. But at a certain point, you know, you can get from any point in this graph down to the end of this story, which is somewhere down here. So there are people who are more powerful as theorists than less. So I'm going to use these people as my Rashomons. Um, and that's what I'll do next, is I have 14 of these life stories. And uh, like you used to do in, um, in sixth grade or fourth grade, you, you might have made transparencies and stuck them on top of each other. You can go to the next slide. And, um, and whoops, and uh, eager, yeah. I double, I double. Yeah. And, and if you stack the stories up on top of each other, you can produce a complete inventory of everything that ever happened in this village. And that's what's done here. So this is um, all, every single event that ever occurred in this little village of Li Lu from the 14 storytellers. There are about 2,000 of them. And some of these events are, are shared. They, they share the same event. So we identify the same event. And then we say, because we've stacked them on top of each other, then boom, they're on top of each other. And you can see that there's this gigantic core of, of shared events that, um, in a giant component that's completely interrelated, that everybody sort of locks in on as, as, as they all produce from their standpoints. So the other thing I'm thinking is each of these people, there's like a feminist, a socialist, a communist, whatever their standpoint is, their standpoint is their life. 
but they're they're telling the story of their life and it's producing this this intersection of incredible dense objects and there's a million other things going on and my idea is I'm going to tell the story of this village and these things happen but they're, they're part of some other history they're not the story of Lilu so my idea is that I'm like a Rashomon I'm going to get I'm going to get the story of Lilu I'm going to get the story of the rape from multiple points of view simultaneously so we can go to the next slide and um and here, um, there's a, a whole series of components in network language. A component is a, is a, is a, is a uh, larger unit that you can get to from anywhere. So if you're in it, you can connect to all the other events. So these are all the different components. There's a big yellow cohesive component here. They're all, if, if you're, this event is tied to every other yellow event. But there's some other, like here's a little red component that connects all these red events and so on. So they're different stories moving on. In terms of graphical representation, um, there's not really time anymore. Time's sort of gone. Um, what there is is, um, dent is depth. Uh, this is an event up here that, that has only one event that's behind it. And this is an event down here that has many events that are behind it. So in rough terms, time moves down because the more things happen before you, the lower you're going to be. But that's not necessarily true. So this is now just an image of the depth of this history. You can go to the next slide. And um, here I'm trying to say that, that actually everybody contributes in their own special way to making this story of Li Lung. So here are the green people. This is the green guy or woman. And those are her elements. And then the yellow person's elements come in here. This is the brown person and so on. So they're all telling their own stories and they interrelate with each other to produce this little history of Lee Lung. So it's not that I could, I could take out a single person and I would have a different object. I mean, I've I've produced this from the multiple points of view simultaneously. Okay, <coughs> next slide. Okay, and then I pretended I was a historian. I read all of the, um, all of the, all of the history of Li Lung, everything that these people said, and um, and I told the story of Li Lung. And then after telling the story of Li Lung, I turned my story into a graph, which starts here and uh, goes through here and ends up here. And um, you can see it's a very nice historical story. It, it, it starts with some events that are, that are interconnected, has this dense middle part, everything is connected. It's a very powerful theory. I'm, I told a standard historical story, which is you know, basically a story of, of poverty, impoverishment, revolution in the countryside. Mao comes in, the communists come in, they take over. And then, and then Mao says this weird thing. He says, to, to, um, to uh, win Yunnan, we have to lose Yunnan. And, and then the, the Maoists pull out. And then there's a period of counter-revolution. The Kuomintang comes in. They rape. They pillage. They slaughter. Um, some of the land, some of the people in the village give them tea, welcome them in. The farmers flee to the countryside. Um, there's a staged war between the, a staged battle between them between the, the communists and the Japanese. There's a complicated story there, and then the communists come back and a golden sun, a golden era appears. So the story is the story of revolution, counter-revolution, and revolution in this village. We can go to the next slide, and um, this is the story for as long as anyone could remember. Life as peasants is hard. Was hard. There was starvation. There was uh, subver subversive agents, guerrilla activity, land landowners began to withdraw to the hills. The Eighth Army came in. Many landowners fled. The Eighth Army, led by Mao, began the blockade of Yunnan. They took over Yunnan. Okay, and then over a decade later, Mao anticipated the return of the Guomindang at a public meeting. His words were repeated to the crowd, to keep Yunnan, we have to lose Yunnan. There's a kind of revolution and it goes on. So this is my story of this village constructed from these people's lives. We can turn the slide. And, um, and here are some of those events. So that just to see that the real history is revealed in here, when the Kuomintang comes in, 
after the communists pull out, they rape, slaughter, and pillage people. And in general, people put that, struck that event here. Uh, you know, some people start their story with that. Their story starts with the rape of their mother or their sister. And that's their story. And so it's the beginning. So some people put it here. And we can go to the next slide. So there's things that happen in, oops, is that the next slide? So. All right. So in theory, uh, I just was trying to be, uh, I could do that for every, I could do that for every event. And, and if you do it for every event, you realize that, that the events themselves then refract away from, from their chronological position because, of course, people are telling their own stories. So what I've tried to do in this study that was there was to try to say I can take, a, I can take life stories, pile them up on top of each other to tell a collective story that couldn't be told by anyone. It doesn't exist as an object, and then ask questions about that history that I've told by transforming it into a structure that you couldn't otherwise see. Each individual has their own story, but the structure is different, and is different than that thin historical story that we tell when we summarize things. And um, by putting it into this larger form, this network of events that are connected by many, many stories, you can actually learn what the key historical events were that made change. Uh, and that's the work that I've been doing. It's got a lot of other pieces to it. This is a, um, this is, um, uh, did you read, do you read Tammy Smith? Okay, so do you know what this is? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, um, this is, um, what Tammy does, of course, this, as you know, is a student of mine um, who now teaches at Stony Brook and um, got interested by virtue of work with Mary Marshall Clark in oral history. And by working with me, got interested in networks and had been doing this phenomenal field work in Istria, this area of, of, ethnic, of ethnic tension between Italians and Slavs, Istrians and Slavs, and in which there was the same alteration of, of ethnic cleansing, regime shift, ethnic cleansing. And, and, and Italians fled, Istrians fled to Italy, Slavs were embedded into the Yugoslav, into, the, into Yugoslavia, and eventually became dominant, of course. And, and what Tammy did is she, she looked at the oral histories that were collected by the, the individuals fleeing from, from this period of ethnic cleansing that were given given to the refugee, in refugee headquarters. And then she went back and she found that these people's grandchildren um, and interviewed them about their experiences, both in Istria, in Italy, and, and in, in, the, in Yugoslavia. So she connected the past and the present through the same generations. And, and she then tries to analyze how it is that these two groups of people, actually they're all also ironically and interesting, living in complete harmony on Coney Island, right? So it all actually started, I guess, in a project of yours, that she went down to Coney Island and found these people who had thrown each other's families into wells all living together. And so that understanding how that happened was, was began this project. But at any rate, what she got, what she discovered was this phenomenal fact that the that these populations tell very different stories. But, but the events that they tell the stories of are the same. So this notion that, that what lies between competing narrations of the past is an, empty, is, is an empty space of silence where stories can't be told, where events aren't recorded, where there's a, a demilitarized zone or a desert of information is, is something she does not reveal. In fact, she reveals that this border area between the two stories is the most populated area in terms of events. It's just that because they're standing in different places, when they look back into the past, they, they grab these events and then they pull them off through, through connotations to other events and narrations to other events in completely different directions. So the most the stories, the, the most divergent stories of the Italians and the Slavs agree on the, the, the shared events, but they deploy them differently. The narration is, is the recovery of the past. The past is recovered. The recovery of the past, the problem with the recovery of the past is not to reveal it, it's to reorganize its narration. So I, I think that's just a huge contribution. And this, this, um, 
says that the, that you could capture an important concept, which is the concept of Padroni. And here we have we have um, we have uh, uh, Italian narratives and conceptual narratives and um, Slavic conceptual narratives centering around this shared concept. So they both this shared concept organizes their discursive space in very similar ways, but it's deployed completely differently. For the Italians, the notions of Padroni are tied, are tied to notions of, um, of harassment, of Yugoslavs coming, of being treated like slaves, of unemployment. And for the Yugoslav, it's, it's, it's associated with liberation, the occupation, invasion, and so on. So they, they take the concept and they do something different with it. And the next slide is probably the coolest slide. Yeah, so this is the border slide. Basically, this says if you take all the Italian narratives and you take all the Slavic narratives, and you you do what I did, and you stick them all together, you produce this dense region of of shared events in the past that they all agree on that are deployed completely differently. So in this boundary area between between narratives of individuals on one or another side of ethnic cleansing lies agreement on history. But again, remembering what Dante said, it's an agreement on the ideal chronicle, just the events as they happen, just as they happen, which is meaningless because the, what makes history, of course, is its connection to the future, which is the narrations that happen after those events that that pull them apart and produce two very different stories. So this is like the best example I've ever seen of, of, the, of the problem that Dante was interested in, that the ideal chronicle of events is not useful because it doesn't tell us what we care about in terms of historical understanding, which is, which is how things in the past are brought into, into the future through our standpoints. Now this is my picaresque journey through narrative history using things that look like oral history that aren't quite oral history. Um, but trying to, to take narrative seriously but not get lost in narrative, not get stuck in narrative and, and the, the seduction of narrative, but to free myself from that seduction of just one thing after another logically unfolding to see what's the structure of that narration. And I, if there's another slide, I'll talk about it. I don't think so. That's it. Thank goodness. Five o'clock, 45 minutes. That's what I'm interested in. I don't know if that's interesting to you. Uh, I'm dying to figure out what Bill does with this stuff. But that's another problem altogether.